As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him. Now where on earth did he get the nerve? This man came up to Jesus face by face to face and by kneeling before him stopped him in his path. Few in the Gospel of Mark approach Jesus that way. A lot of the people Jesus heals don't even come to him on their own. Many are brought by family or friends. At least one is simply present where Jesus happens to be, in the synagogue, and Jesus invites him to be healed. One woman was bold enough to seek healing by touching his cloak, but she didn't block his way. She came from behind and hoped she would remain unnoticed. In fact, perhaps the only other person in Mark who seems unafraid to step right into Jesus' path is a demoniac in chapter 5 who lives among the tombs, so racked by demons that he cannot even be restrained by chains. It's easy to picture Jesus surrounded by people shouting, Look at me! Look at me, Jesus! But if we read the healing stories closely, we come away wondering how many were bold enough to say that to stand in front of Jesus, unafraid of what he might see when he looks at you? Uh. In Mark's Gospel, it appears that those willing to put themselves in Jesus' path and say, look at me, Jesus, tended to be either completely out of their heads or else just accustomed to getting what they wanted. And that makes sense. The delusional usually don't have any idea how they look to anyone, and the privileged are accustomed to looking good to everyone. The man who knelt before Jesus today is in the latter category. He does not appear to be out of his head, but as we learn, he does have a lot of possessions. It's safe to assume he's a person of privilege. It's safe to assume he's used to looking good. He is also probably used to the privilege of stopping important people in their tracks and demanding to be looked at. What a curious case he is, this wealthy fellow blocking Jesus' path. How different he seems from the others. Unlike those who are brought by friends or who hope only to touch Jesus' cloak from behind, he does not seem to be suffering from anything that would make him unattractive or unclean. No leprosy, no paralysis, no withered hand, no epilepsy, no uncontrollable bleeding, nothing that might make him reluctant to be looked at. So he's confident in getting Jesus' attention, blocking Jesus' path to kneel before him with a question. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Perhaps it doesn't surprise him that Jesus doesn't answer right away. Don't polite people habitually deflect a compliment? Doesn't it sound like that's what Jesus is doing when he says, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. The man just lets that blow by him while he focuses on the reassuring words that follow. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. How excited the man must be. It's a perfect opening because he can answer in all honesty, Teacher, I have kept these since my youth. That's a statement he surely expects will be met with approval. This is a person accustomed not only to looking good, but to doing good, knowing how to behave. So approval is what he's used to. And maybe this man doesn't really expect Jesus to give him advice. After all, he refers to his eternal life as an inheritance. The Greek says an allotment. He's used to getting his share. He assumes a share is already set aside for him. Maybe his question is really just an excuse to say, look at me, Jesus, and hear Jesus say, wow, you look great. This privileged man may never hunger for food, but he might very well be hungry for approval. And how sweet it would be to hear Jesus say, you are good. What human being does not want approval? Who among us does not want to hear, you're good? And when we seek approval, we seek it from those whose opinion matters most, 
someone above us in authority. Children and those of us who used to be children seek approval from parents. Students seek approval from teachers. Employees seek approval from bosses. Parishioners and pastors seek approval from each other. And the man in today's story sought it from Jesus, and everyone wants approval from God. Now, when we go seeking approval, we don't go in our worst clothes. We don't present what we've done badly and expect to receive approval. Students, and you can back me up on this, students don't stand before teachers and say, well, I blew off the homework and I plagiarized my term paper and expect to hear, well done, thou good and faithful student. <laughs> We're not going to present ourselves before an authority and say, look at me, unless we're confident that we look good. So how happy the man in today's story must have been when Jesus brought up the commandments. This is an area in which he shines. Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Now recognize me, Jesus, in my righteousness. Tell me I'm good. The Bible is full of people seeking God's approval, pleading their righteousness before the heavenly throne. The Psalms are full of it, and perhaps no one pleads more eloquently and with more justification than Job, whose story is also part of our scripture lesson for today. The book of Job tells us from the beginning that Job was a righteous man and then some. When he suffers unthinkable tragedy, his friends insist that he must have done something wrong. Job responds that if he could only plead his case before God in a heavenly court, his righteousness would be acknowledged. When he has tested me, says Job, I shall come out like gold. I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. Job is not afraid to say, look at me, God, and he expects to hear God answer, you are good. We always hear that Job lost everything, but his belief in his own goodness is a possession he seems to have retained. Doesn't Job sound like the man kneeling in Jesus' path? Teacher, I've kept all these since my youth, and he waits for Jesus to say it, Wow, you really are good. Keep up the good work and you're going to be fine. Instead, Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Jesus had already told him, No one is good but God alone. But the man was shocked all the same. He was used to hearing that he was good. He had spent a lifetime assembling a version of himself that routinely won approval. That's what gave him the confidence to cry, look at me, Jesus. And Jesus did. And Jesus loved what he saw. It says so right there in the text. Jesus, looking at him, loved him but not because he was good. Jesus loved him in his weakness. Jesus loved him in his deep imperfection. Jesus loved him with compassion, seeing his hunger for approval. Jesus looked at him and saw right through him and still loved him because Jesus' nature is to love. And although he was loved, the man went away grieving. Why? Because he had many possessions, which Jesus said he should get rid of. And those possessions were the skeleton of a teetering and fragile creation that he had spent a lifetime assembling, a version of a self that would win approval from the world. To that attractive version of a self, he had thought, perhaps, to add something, some deed of righteousness, some religious observance, some praiseworthy behavior that would win him eternal life. And Jesus said, indeed, he did lack one thing. What he needed to add was subtraction. Now, the words that follow, Jesus' warning about wealth and camels and needles, 
are very familiar and very disturbing. And they should never get less disturbing. They should disturb us every time we read them. But because they are so disturbing and hit so close to home, when we read these passages, our attention tends to go right to those verses. And sometimes it might do us good to look around those verses and ask ourselves what else of importance might be happening in this story. Jesus' words about wealth and the kingdom of God are framed in this story by two radical assertions. First, no one is good but God alone. And last, for mortals it is impossible to be saved, but for God all things are possible. That is the alpha and omega of this story. We all want to be found good. We want that even more than we want material possessions, and we really, really want material possessions. All of us do, all the time. We want them because in some way our possessions are tied to our need to be found good. We use them to assemble versions of ourselves for the world's approval. If we have the smart things, the interesting things, the respectable things, they demonstrate to the world that we are smart or interesting or respectable. And then we can say to the world, look at me. And our hope will be that the world will respond, you're good. When we've heard those words a few times, they become a favorite possession. Like our material possessions, they give us the confidence to say, look at me. And like our material possessions, the words that signify approval are hard to let go of. When Jesus tells the man to sell his possessions, it's consistent with a theme in this section of Mark. It's a theme of subtraction, the stripping away of anything that gets between us and the kingdom of God. It's a theme of radical subtraction. Just a few verses up the page is that frightening passage where Jesus says, if your hand or foot or eye causes you to stumble, cut it off, tear it out. But what will happen then to the version of ourselves that we present to the world? Cut off the hand or foot, tear out the eye, and how will we look to the world? Broken. Get rid of our possessions, and how will we look to the world? Bereft. Will we be brave enough then to say, look at me? Or will we quickly try to reassemble the pleasing version, the version that wins approval, adding one more possession, one more righteous deed, one more praiseworthy behavior to make us look good again? If our favorite possession is those sweet words, you're good, let them go. I'm not arguing that we are all totally depraved like Calvin would. I'm just reading what Jesus said here. No one is good but God alone. This suggests that we do not understand goodness any more than we understand God. This is what Job expresses when he cries later, he stands alone and who can dissuade him? What he desires, that he does. For he will complete what he appoints for me and many such things are in his mind. Therefore, I am terrified at his presence. God's goodness is so radical that if judged by our human understanding, we might find it terrifying. We cannot achieve goodness because we do not even understand it. We try so hard and we acquire so much in order to look good, but we don't even know what real goodness looks like. If our favorite possession is a catalog of all the things we've done to inherit eternal life, let it go. It is impossible for us to be saved, but for God, all things are possible. If we could let go of those favorite possessions, would it loosen our grip on everything else that gets between us and the kingdom of God? Judging from Jesus' words in Mark, I'd say that one of the biggest obstacles in that path is our ongoing attempt to look good. 
that ongoing attempt to assemble a self worth looking at, a self that gives us the confidence to say, look at me, maybe even enough confidence to step into Jesus' path and say, look at me, Jesus, unafraid of what he might see. Here is the news of the Gospels. We don't have to be afraid of what Jesus will see, not because we look good, but because Jesus looks with love. We can let go of our need for approval. We can let go of our hope to be good. We can stop worrying about what Jesus might see and listen to what he surely will say. The scriptures assure us that we may cry out in all confidence, look at me, Jesus. Not because Jesus will answer, you are good, but because Jesus will answer, you are loved. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, look at us as only you can look and love us as only you can love. May your love make us fearless and free. We pray in your name. Amen. <coughs> we close with hymn 268, How Shall I Meet You, Jesus? Let's stand.